Hello and welcome to the Retro Hour podcast, episode number 164. Your weekly dose of retro gaming and technology news with me, Dan Wood. Me, Ravi Abbott. And me, Joe Fox. And I kind of feel like we should be having some kind of birthday celebrations after the big news this week that the World Wide Web is 30 years old. I only found this jazz version of Happy Birthday, but it's quite nice, isn't it? <laughs> 30 years old. Yeah. So, so, what was the first thing you did online, Dan? First thing I ever did online. I remember the web, actually, when we got it at school, probably about 95, we had like four computers you could go on the internet on. You had to book it like a day in advance and you get an hour on there. It was just a mad, like, put a floppy disk in, download everything I could in like that one hour and hang out, weirdly enough, on the Pearl Jam chat room. There's some kid before me left open. I had no interest in Pearl Jam, but he used to hang out in there. I called myself the dude. And I used to troll everybody else in there, so... <laughs> I joined quite late on my friend's demon account. Yeah. And then I would basically just go onto Yahoo chat and troll Americans. And yep. we'd have a big back and forth all the time. And uh, you could override the mic on this function. Yeah, that got very annoying. Bit of a kind of theme here that we, we, we all trolls. What was your... Yeah. <laughs> was uh, hang out like first that. thing you did. Uh, for me, I think I accidentally trolled myself. So <laughs> I was about... It was about 99, uh, and we were on a school trip to a place called Kingswood. And uh, it was my first experience completely... Never barely even been on a computer. Yeah. And it was like, oh, you had to search the web for images, and one of them was Papa Smurf, and one of them was Charles Dickinson. And I accidentally somehow ended up looking at gay porn <laughs> which may, also, accidentally. May, may also be my first instance of like ever seen and I remember I had to get the teacher and I was just like I don't know what's going off here there's like pop ups and stuff great introduction uh, to the internet yeah. all of it classic like, Joe classic, classic Joe classic <laughs> so we are going to talk more about the because uh, you know the web is 30 years old this week we've got some interesting stories some stuff that's kind of resurfaced and been doing the rounds this week and a great website I need to share with you guys in just a bit. Now, also, we've got an amazing guest on the podcast this week. We're going to be joined by a veteran, a marketing industry veteran, Bruce Everest. You know all those kind of programming whiz kids and all the cool style where they'll be going in like sports cars and driving around. I've made millions out of this game. Bruce kind of helped create that image and he worked at Imagine Software and he also worked at Codemasters, such a massive company. Yeah, now you've probably seen, I think anyone that's into British video games of that era has watched, I mean, it's on YouTube if you want to watch it, a documentary called Commercial Breaks. And this was in the mid 80s, they went to film a British computer company that were doing really well, trying to get the story of their rise and how well they're doing. Turns out the company went bankrupt in the middle of filming this. As, as they were filming it, <laughs> yeah. the bailiffs were coming in and they were trying to block the doors and stuff. And really? this was all on the BBC. It was absolutely mad. I've not heard of this. You will definitely watch it. I'll put a link in our show notes if anyone hasn't seen it. But Bruce was right in the middle of all that. You know, He was like the marketing manager of Imagine Software. And he had this uh, job because they, they had these mega games that they were going to release. That, bear in mind, the average video game then cost about, what, like two or three quid? Yeah. And they were going to release these £40 games for the Spectrum that he, he had the job of hyping up, even though they didn't really exist. Oh, wow. So it's a really interesting guest that we've got this week. I mean, we've wanted Bruce on the show for years. Oh, yeah. And I'm glad we finally have. And also the inside story of Codemasters in their heyday as well. So Bruce Everest is going to be coming up on the Retro Hour podcast in around 15 minutes from now. Now, before we get into the show this week, we need to give a big mention to the people who make it possible for us to do the Retro Hour podcast every single week. I tell people that, like, I do a video games podcast. I'm like, all right, how often do you do it? Like, what, every couple of months? No, every week. Like, what, every single week? And they're like, how long have you done it for? And you're yeah. like, a few years. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you think I look as old as I am? I'm only 21, really. <laughs> um, but we have got you to thank for letting us come in here, do this podcast week in, week out. The people who find it in their hearts to support the Retro Hour podcast, help going to the running of the show, all the costs that we have. And that is people who make a donation through our website at theretrohour.com. And for making a donation of any amount, you will find your place in the very prestigious Retro Hour Hall of Fame. Just like this week, Jim Slavas, Martin Gustav Anderson, Raymond Montalban and Michael Verdi, who all made donations into the running of the show. And if you'd like to do the same, guys, it really does make a massive difference and helps us, you know, not have to pay for the show out of our own pocket, which yeah. is always helpful. Just go to the retrohour.com and press support, and you'll be able to donate there. A little PayPal link there, isn't there? It takes yeah. a couple of seconds. And also, while we're talking about people who support this show, 
The Economist are back on board as well. Now, you know how much we love The Economist. They've been big supporters of the Retro Hour podcast over the last few months. And The Economist is the smart guide to the forces impacting your world. Now, the reason we love The Economist is, I mean, a lot of people assume from the title it's going to be like, you know, economics and finance, which it is, but also it covers so much more as well, including things that we talk about, like video games. Like we were mentioning last year that I had no idea that China is the biggest video games market in the world. Yeah, China is the biggest video games market in the world. And also, there's an article here which is talking about how China basically have to approve all the games that are coming out. And they started approving more, but I I really didn't think a government would be looking at the games and going, okay, this one's good, this one's not good for our society. Yeah, and they explain the kind of things they look for and kind of, there's been a big backlog of them. Apparently they approved like 80 games in December, the government did for release. (laughs) And the fact that even with those kind of bottlenecks in place... It's still the biggest video games industry in the I world. Is crazy. I have no idea. I just instantly assume it'd be the US or something. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Well, we, we read this article last year and we were amazed. But I mean, that's the kind of stuff you can find in The Economist. It helps you find out what's going on in the world, things that you probably didn't know. And we've mentioned this about The Economist before. It's been going 170 years. So you know you can trust them. And it's kind of for the person that never stops asking questions. So we've actually got a little offer for you. We'd love you to check out The Economist for yourself. Now, we've got a chance for you to get a free print copy of The Economist in the post. No strings, nothing like that. All you've got to do is text the word retro and send that to 78070. So if you'd like to get a free print copy of The Economist, it'll come through your letterbox on us and you'll be helping out the podcast as well by doing this. All you've got to do is text the word retro and send that to 78070 with The Economist, the smart guide to the forces changing your world. Well, let's talk about the World Wide Web celebrating its 30th anniversary this week. Very big landmark, that. Yeah, I noticed on everybody on Twitter was like, this is my first post, this is my first, and they were all putting images of it. I was desperately searching for the Wayback Machine to see if it had (laughs) saved anything of mine. Well, I did find this amazing website. Now, this is actually made by um, a guy that hangs out in the um, Retro Battle Stations subreddit on Reddit, and it's called theoldnet.com. Now, what it does is, because I mean, you mentioned the Wayback Machine there, and the Wayback Machine is part of archive.org, and their goal is to kind of archive the web from its earliest days to now. Yeah, so it takes screenshots of certain sites at different periods of time. Well, uh, that's your real HTML grabs, aren't they? You can use them. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. and uh, even to the point that you can still get on a few files of the stuff, but they're kind of like snapshots of that time period yeah. of the uh, website. The only thing about archive.org is you can't really use it on old computers because it's got a lot of JavaScript embedded at the top, Uh, all those frames and everything. But this site here, I mean, it gives you a couple of boxes. It looks like an old school kind of mid-90s website. But they've got a little search bar there. You can put in a web address. Then there's a drop-down menu going from 1994 to 2005. And you can type that site and that'll strip out all of the code that the Wayback Machine puts in there and serve that up so you can actually browse that on an old school computer. I love that scripts and no scripts because yeah. <laughs> that was a really early thing on the internet where you'd have frames or no frames because having a frame on your site was so advanced. Yeah, well, yeah, it was. I was going to say, I'm loving life on the old N64 websites here. So <laughs> this is pretty cool. Well, they pick out some of their favorites as well, yeah. which are really cool. I mean, you know, and you can get a snapshot. I was looking at, like, you know, Sony's website in 1995 when the PlayStation came out and Netscape's website. They've even got working kind of snapshots of stuff like Alta Vista and Webcrawler from the mid 90s. Yeah, I saw some. Something similar to this site, which actually had like snapshots, but what you could do is you could choose the old browser. So you'd say, oh, let's look at this site, but in Netscape Navigator right. <laughs> or in Mosaic or one of these really early ones. But I love the fact that, you know, you can go on your Windows 3.1 PC and actually really browse these sites as they were back yeah, then. Yeah, that's now. awesome. Yeah, so I'll put links to Probably that. Probably a bit faster, though. <laughs> well, it is, yeah. It actually it loads really quick because, I mean, they're all HTML 1.0 websites. Now, one of the things that's been doing the rounds this week, and it's an article that has kind of been haunting this guy since he wrote it back in 1995, and this is a guy called Clifford Stoll. Now, Clifford is actually a really clever guy, and um, he did a book a few years ago, he does lectures all around the world, called The Cuckoo's Egg, and he was tracking a spy um, from Russia who was trying to do espionage on a mainframe machine yeah. um, when he was working at, um, I think it was Berkeley he was at at the time. A really interesting guy, but... He wrote this article in 1995 about why the World Wide Web will never take off and why it's nonsense. (laughs) Now, he's talking about stuff here. Let me read a couple of quotes from this. Do our computer pundits lack common sense? The truth is no online database will replace your daily newspaper. No CD-ROM 
will take the place of a competent teacher and no computer network will ever change the way government works. Nice. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Not the best predictions in hindsight. And then he goes on a little bit further down this article and he's talking about stuff about, you know, how online shopping's never going to take off. Listen to this little quote here. We're promised instant catalogue shopping, just point and click for great deals. Apparently we'll order airline tickets over the network, we'll make restaurant reservations and negotiate sales contracts. Stores will become obsolete. Well, how come my local mall does more business in an afternoon than the entire internet handles in a month? Even if there were a trustworthy way to send money over the internet, which there isn't, it's missing the most important thing, salespeople. I'd love to kind of grab this guy now, <laughs> pull, it, pull him into the modern days, and he'd just be like, uh, and then Is take he still him alive? back. Yeah. He's still alive, he still yeah. lectures, and he, he just, whenever this kind of surfaces, I mean, every few years, like BuzzFeed or someone will pick it up yeah. and post it, like, look how wrong this guy got it. And he, he comes out and says, all right, look, I was completely off the mark. But you know what? I think most of us didn't have that view. Because, you know, if I had, I would have invested in Bitcoin or yeah. I would have made a big online shopping company oh. or something. Oh, you know? gosh, absolutely. I remember being young and, you know, everybody was getting into texting in secondary school and stuff. And I was like, oh, why is everybody always doing that? Just give them a call, just ring them. I never ring anybody now. Like, ever. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. So it's just, it's just eating your own words, isn't it, really? And there is some stuff in here that actually he did get right. I mean, everyone kind of rips him for this, but he's also talking at one stage about how the fact that the web is like anyone can put anything on there and all you're really getting is like a a wall of sound and voices coming at you and everything. Which, you know, look at Twitter today, it's like that, isn't it? Kind of. I think there's two levels of the web. I think there's the data collection level of the web and then there's just the users. And yeah. the companies are using the web in a very different, scary kind of way at the moment and the users are kind of just... Uh, going along with it. so we'll see what happens but i mean you know since this time i mean you can understand when he was writing this in 1995 most of the web was completely unfiltered and oh yeah the big brands yeah. that you know it wasn't newspapers it was home journalists and stuff so stuff probably wasn't as accurate as it is today but i mean there is some stuff in it you do pick out i mean he's even talking about how the fact that um you know meeting friends over a network is not really a substitute for meeting a friend over a coffee and you know, which, which, if, if the net wasn't here, we wouldn't have this podcast yeah. i wouldn't have met you <laughs> yeah. i wouldn't have met joe you know so like you said, if we tried to predict what it'd be like. Well, if that's, in the if that's 95 when he wrote that as well, Amazon came a year after. Yeah, and eBay. <laughs> yeah, about yeah. Then, yeah, so it was very early days of the web, but looking at it, it is kind of quaint and uh, does make you giggle a bit. So I'll link that up in the show notes as well this week if you fancy a bit of a laugh. And happy 30th anniversary of the World Wide Web. Go on, Rav, you make a prediction now. What will the web be like in 30 years? Dead. And we'll, we'll, we'll all be using telegrams. Apocalyptic. <laughs> Pigeons. <laughs> now I'm gonna, Fire some, signals. I'm going to pick that up in 30 years and like rip you now for that. Yeah. When it has died, yeah. <laughs> now, before we get into our chat with um, Bruce, a couple of other stories we need to talk about as well. I mean, obviously, we're going to be covering Codemasters today. And there is, seems like there's one of these every year at the moment, another Dizzy game. Bum, bum, yes. Bum. So this is Panic Dizzy and... The Olivers, this is uh, very interesting. They've kind of been finding dizzy games in their attic. They must have a never-ending attic full of games uh, because there's a few that haven't been on release that they've just recently released. So Wonderland Dizzy was one, Dream World Pogi, Mystery World Dizzy, and now it's Panic Dizzy's time. And this is coming out on the NES. Yeah, so it's going to be on a NES cart. It's uh, been restored by uh, Lucas Kerr, who's a dizzy-like total... Massive Super fan, fan isn't he? Super yeah, fan, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So he's basically rediscovered it and restored it, and now it's coming on a NAS. So, and it's, so, so let me get my head around this. So this looks cool. Let me, little disclaimer, this looks cool as hell. They found it in their attic. Yeah, so the <laughs> Olivers made so many Dizzy games. That right. They, they actually forgot how many they made. So they actually forgot about this. Yeah, one. and there's a lot of that's titles. what's blowing my mind, because <laughs> this is a labour of love. Like, this isn't just like... It looks legit. It looks good. Oh, no, I think this was full commercial games. Yeah, and you know. how would you forget that? Like, when you... Ravi told me about this earlier on, and I was just like, okay, this looks cool. Let's click on the link. And it's already smashed its target by seven grand. Yeah. And I'm like, wow, okay, right. Right, I've got pie on my face here for thinking, like, what's going on here? But that's crazy. It's mad, <laughs> because a, f a few years ago, we went to see the Olivers, and they showed us... the. They, they were just doing their exhibition at the National Video Game Arcade and they showed us all of these maps and they said, like, we were looking through the stuff in our loft and we found this mystery world map and we were yeah. like, what is this? Is this a level from a game? Can you remember <laughs> this? And and being twins and, you know, the amount that they produced as well. 
Yeah. It, it probably just gets lost in everything, you know. Well, so they even kept their bedroom curtains from the early 80s. They don't wow. throw anything away. I guess we're just kind of in the zone of making so many games at the time. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, forgot about it. But it's cool, though, you know, that these games exist. And the fact they keep finding more of them as well. I'd love to have a route around their attic. <laughs> yeah, see what, see what else is in there. Do you want to keep these games, lads? <laughs> <laughs> Sneak down the stairs of yeah. these. So if you don't want to check it out, it's on Kickstarter right now. We'll link that up in the show notes this week. Now, uh, let's give a big shout to our friends at the Retro Computing Museum in Leicester, who've been phenomenally successful recently. You even saw them on the BBC the other day. Yeah, so uh, you can get this on iPlayer, so we're going to put it in the show notes, and this is called Inside Out, which is one of those kind of regional shows where they're just like, let's see what's going on in the Midlands, or yeah. let's see what's going on in Scotland. This is the East Midlands edition. I was watching it last night, halfway through, I just turned to Channel One and it was like retro gaming in the East Midlands, and I was like, what? It was and meant to be. <laughs> it was like, it was a good half an hour, and they had first Retro Computer Museum Leicester, Yeah where they talked about the whole museum there. They interviewed Andy, and that was really cool. Then they went to Retro World in Derby as well. And they interviewed... Which is a shop, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. which is You know is what, I did see that on Facebook, that they were getting interviewed. They said they were getting interviewed for something on the BBC. And just, you know, mindlessly scrolling through Facebook, because it's like, oh, cool. Yeah. <laughs> like... they, they, they did a, a section on gaming, uh, the big gaming markets as well. Yeah. And they also put an Amiga down there and said... This was the bad boy. This was better than all of the machines back then. This is what everybody wanted. And I was like, whoa. <laughs> so it was like half an hour feature all about retro gaming. Yeah, yeah. yeah. crazy. Well, if people want to watch it, it is on iPlayer. Which, good thing about the BBC, you can access iPlayer anywhere in the UK or with VPN anywhere in the world. Uh, but, I mean, that's awesome that, that primetime BBC are covering and stuff it, like And that. it's focusing on the area that we're in, in the East yeah. Midlands, which we really think retro gaming seems to be popping off at the moment here. Shame we didn't know it was going to be happening. Didn't we? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Next time, BBC, come on, hit us up. So I'll put a link to that. And everything else we talked about this week, we put all the show notes on our website, save you Googling at theretrohour.com. Now, just before we get into our chat with Bruce Everest, that you're going to love this week, all about Imagine Software and Codemasters, now that we're into, well into March now, you know, here in the UK, less than two weeks until the clocks go forward. Oh, God. Anyone else ready for, like, warm summer's evenings and 9pm sunsets? I've already been out in my garden. It's been quite nice recently, oh, hasn't it? Oh, it's free- yeah. It was nice a couple of weeks ago. It's freezing yeah. again now. <laughs> well, I'm thinking, cause I moved house. I haven't had a chance to use my new garden yet, which is nice. I'm thinking, how nice is it going to be sitting out there in the sunshine with a nice chill beer in my hand? Everyone's excited for that. Well, we've timed this well, haven't we? Our good friends from Beer 52 are back on board as well. Now, as a listener to our show, we've got together with them, and you can actually get, ready for that warmer weather, a free case of craft beers. That's awesome. How awesome is that? Also, you can listen to the Retro Hour while I was drinking it. (laughs) (laughs) Now, all you have to do is nip onto their website. We've got a little link here. Head to beer52.com forward slash retro. And the thing about B52 is, I mean, they sponsored the show back in December for a few weeks as well. They were very, very popular. Loads of people jumped on this as well. They are the world's most popular monthly craft beer discovery club. And what they do is they search out incredible, exclusive, small batch craft beers from the world's greatest breweries and bring them back for their members. So it's not the stuff you're going to find in the supermarket. You know, it's stuff that, if you, if you like your beer and you want something a bit different. Yeah, this is proper craft ale, isn't it? Absolutely. And... They've actually got, at the moment, some really cool stuff. You can try one-of-a-kind Citra Grisette, which sounds amazing. That's a collaboration brew for our Met Fine Ales, representing the UK. They've got stuff from Sweden in there as well. What about this? A Mango Milkshake IPA by Tiny Rebel from Wales. How amazing does that sound? Milkshake IPA. <laughs> it's one of them where you just keep drinking it and you're like, oh... Why am I suddenly really pissed? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is just milkshake, surely. Yeah. But there is, I mean, there's something for everybody's taste. Whether you love craft beers or you just want to try it out as well, um, it's definitely worth a try. And you can get your first case for free. All you have to do is pay £5.95 for postage. You'll get eight incredible craft beers. They're for Ment Magazine as well. That gives you a bit of information about what's happening and stuff that you'll be interested in. And also, they even include a snack as well with next day shipping. No brainer, no commitment or anything like that. Just take the free case if you want. Try the beers and see what you think. If it's not for you, you can pause and cancel at any time. All you have to do is head to beer52.com forward slash retro and claim your free case today. Right then, let's get the history of Imagine Software and Codemasters with this week's special guest, Bruce Everest. You're listening to the Retro Hour podcast and it's time to welcome on this week's very special guest. It is our pleasure to welcome to the show... Bruce Everest, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, it's a pleasure being here. Now, before we get into stories about, you know, Imagine Software and Codemasters that we, we can't wait to get your stories about, I mean, let's just kind of go back to, you know, the start. I mean, what, what kind of got you first 
interested in computers? Well, when I was just, when I was young, before I even left school, I was really interested in business. And so, as soon as I left school, I thought, well, how can I learn about business? So I studied to be an accountant. And then after I learned to be an accountant with this company I trained with, I set up a computerized bookkeeping company. Very boring, I know, but... Uh, and then I was reading the professional computer magazines then, like Computing and Computer Weekly, and they were starting to mention these things called home computers that were starting to happen in America. So I thought, that's really, really interesting. So I studied it up like crazy, and as soon as I became available, I, I opened my own computer store, basically. And that was Micro Digital. Yeah, and that was, I think, now, I think that was 78 or 77. It was around about there then, anyhow. That must have been one of the first computer shops in the UK, surely? Yes. So what I did um, was I sold, there was a kit computer came out called the NASCOM, and that was very popular, and I sold lots and lots of those. And because it had 1,200 soldering joints on the back, most people who built them, they wouldn't work. So I, 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 I set up a, a workshop and, and put a repair service in. And then Apples came along, Apple IIs, sold those. And uh, Science of Cambridge Mark 14, so sort of precursor to the, to the Sinclair computers, mm-hmm. and lots of books, tons and tons of books, and computer memory, stuff like that. You know? Well, wasn't much of a computer scene in, in Liverpool at that time. Yeah, it was, it was pretty red hot, actually, because there was, there was a, right from the beginning, a lot of radio amateurs, because radio amateurs are into electronics, and they went, wow, this is fantastic for us. And they set up a computer club. And they really knew what they were doing because they were used to playing with electronics all the time. And so it, uh, it was, and then we got involvement then with the university because the university had a, a microprocessor department. And microprocessors has really only just been invented. So they were right at the very sort of bleeding edge of technology at the university. The amateurs with the, with the computer club were right at the bleeding end of technology. And, 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 and we kind of just mucked in with them. And what kind of software would these people be using? Ah, yes. <laughs> Not much, really. <laughs> um, Microsoft yeah, came out with languages, obviously, uh, and they, they brought out a basic eventually for the, for, for, for the Apple II. There, there, there wasn't an internet to swap things on and download things on, and uh, everything used cassette interfaces to, to, to store stuff. Uh, but the, the big thing... The big, big breakthrough, I think, was when I went to America in, 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 the, in those late 70s, you know, 78 or something. Mm-hmm. And I went to California, and I went to an American computer store there called Computer Components of Orange County. And in America, there weren't many computer stores then. There was still just a handful across the whole of the United States. And I went into Computer Components of Orange County to see how they did it, or what they were up to, and seeing if I could learn any tricks. And at the back of the store, there was a dirty grey big notice board, and pinned to it were polythene bags. And in the polythene bags were cassettes. And they were games, largely, that people had made at home and then were selling via the computer store. So I bought a whole pile of these, and I brought them home, and I just let my staff loose on them. And I think those games were all over the country almost instantly. And these are obviously the days before, you know, even flashy packaging, box art, none of that existed then. No, it, it was just be a cassette mm-hmm. in, in a polythene bag with a, with a photocopied sheet of paper. Well, I mean, after a couple of years, you, you sold the store to, to Lasky's after, after a few years. Why did you decide to sell up and what was that a good move at the time? Uh, well, basically, um, I didn't realise at the time, but I, I could never get the, the, the cash flow working. I could never, I could never get the business fluid in the cash flow, and, you know, and pay the bills and pay the wages and sign everything. What it was, was actually, was, was a member of staff was stealing from me. Oh, wow. And, and, and that was crippling the business. Uh, but luckily, one of my customers was a director of Lasky's, a guy called Alan Sterling. And he said, Lasky's really should uh, be starting to get in his home computer lock. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll go and talk to the powers that be and see if we can buy your business to give us a, a head start kind of thing. How did that lead you to working at Imagine? Ah, well, once we joined Lasky's, we were doing stores within stores, and they really didn't need me 
as an entrepreneur anymore because the business that I had had before was largely mail order with one shop and then suddenly we had stores all over the country and, and, and the mail order was pretty much closing down. And, and it was becoming very much a box industry, you know, by Sharp M's, ADK boxes. And so we kind of agreed to go our separate ways. And I worked as a consultant for a while to a number of people, uh, and including, for instance, uh, uh, an office equipment company called Dams, and, but also for Bug Bite. When I went into Bug Bite, they, the, the, the two Allens who ran it were very, very geeky, and they didn't have much idea about how to reach their public. So I changed that because that's what I've been doing for a few years then. For instance, I, I, I sorted out doing proper packaging, which they hadn't had. So I did you know, multi-fold packaging, like the music industry, with, 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 with a color image to represent the game, which was all new stuff then. And at Bug Bite was Mark Butler, who had been an employee of mine, and there was Eugene Evans, who had been an employee of mine. Mark Butler and David Lawson left Bug Bite to set up Imagine, and they asked me to join them, which I did. When you got to Imagine, I mean, was that kind of one of your, your goals to kind of get their games into more, more high street retailers and have more prominence? Okay, well, just as when I set up my computer store, there was no video games. When Imagine set up, there was no game stores. There were no game stores. Mm -hmm. Just there was just you know maybe a handful of hobbyist computer stores across the country. It was all done by mail order. And I remember when Arcadia uh, first came out, we all sat on the floor in the office with stacks and stacks of sticky cardboard and boxes and boxes full of Arcadias, getting and, and, and making mail bags full of parcels, hundreds and hundreds, thousands of parcels going out the door. We we had to handle the stock ourselves. So one of the things I did was to try to set up a retail video game industry. So I employed some girls who were telesales experts who were used to ringing people up. And in fact, I stole them from Dams, uh, so some telesales girls. And then we've got all the yellow pages for the whole of the United Kingdom. They, they, <laughs> they covered a whole wall of yellow pages stacked up. And then they went through all the yellow pages ringing different sorts of shops. So they'd ring, say, every electronics shop or every photographic shop or so on in, in, in a yellow pages, and they'd go and get another yellow pages and do the same. And gradually, we recruited people to sell our product. So gradually, we went from being a mail order to company to a company that supplied retailers. And then, obviously, those retailers then started buying games from other companies like uh, Quicksilver and, uh, and so on, you know, who were the early companies around at the time. But, but, it, but it, was, it was those girls, really, who created the, the UK retail video game industry, which, when they'd finished doing so, it was the most successful in the world at the time. Well, how well was Imagine doing in those first years? Oh, ridiculously well. The, the turnover just kept on doubling every month until we got up to, up to a million pounds a month, uh, with, with quite a small staff, really, you know, with a, with a, with a big profit margin and... It wasn't done off the back of very many products either. So, the, you know, the development costs weren't very high. It was, it was incredibly successful. Well, I know around that time, Imagine kind of became the poster child of, like, the, the new, you know, the bedroom rock star programmer. And how much excess and extravagance was there at the company? Uh, not much. <laughs> that, that, that's all. That's all. That, what I thought was, because I was in charge of marketing. Yeah. When you, when you, at the end of the day... The development people, the programmers and the artists, the games designers, all they produce is a master cassette. You know, they don't produce you know, the public perception, the image of the product. It's the same in the music industry and it's the same in the film industry. And those industries don't say, don't promote something on the back of you know, the, the number of you know, riffs or whatever. And they do it on the back of the people. So I decided to promote the people in Imagine Software rather than the product. So I got a, recruited a general public PR company, and that PR company then did press releases and invited journalists around. And we went off the back of Eugene Evans uh, because he was so young. I think he was 16 at the time. And the, the, the press just lapped it up. And we got everywhere, really. We, we, we got American television. We got... 
uh, BBC, ITV. It was the first time that the video game industry had been noticed by the wider public, but it did not happen by accident. It happened because I employed a PR company to make it happen. <laughs> to make it seem big and glamorous and sexy. That's right, yeah. exactly the same as the film industry and the music industry. I say, you know, you don't see a film you know, promoted on the fact that where it's cited or what the story is or whatever, they're always put on, on, on who the stars are. Well, I mean, you mentioned Eugene Evans there. I mean, famously, there was that story that he had a, a high-end sports car, but he was too young to drive it. Well, we, he could drive when we bought We bought him a Lotus, hmm. but he could drive by the time he got it, yes. <laughs> Just. Just, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, around that time, obviously, one of the most famous things that Imagine is remembered for was the um, the BBC documentary um, that's now infamous in, you know, the British video games industry, Commercial Breaks. I mean, w- did they approach you then? And what, why did you decide to let the BBC kind of do a an, an inside story? That must have been quite a, a nod to the company's credibility that the BBC well, were interested. Yeah, well, we, we, we were the highest profile game company in Britain. And, you know, we'd had all the publicity. And it was an industry that was growing-ish. It was growing-ish because what happened was it hit a brick wall. The whole industry hit a brick wall when the great public discovered tape-to-tape copying. Our turnover went from a million pounds a month to nothing. <laughs> you know, you, you make a new game, ship it, and then the next thing you know, you, you, they did what would happen is uh, W.H. Smith had a, a returns policy. So People would go and buy a game, take it home, copy it, and then bring it back for their money back. And it's, it's theft, it's thieving, but it, it pretty much destroyed the 8-bit video game industry. And, and there was quite a lot of video game companies around then. I mean, if you go and look on one of the Sinclair sites, at the list of, of video game publishers for the Sinclair Spectrum, I think you'll get to a list of more than 100. And... By the time that got through to sort of the console industry, it was, uh, there was about four or five of them left. But, but even just between the 8-bit and, and the Amiga, you know, most of them were eliminated. It, it bust most, most of the game companies, the tape tape copying. You mentioned piracy was such an issue there. Um, was it kind of unstoppable, or did you guys try and put any measures in there? Oh, we did all sorts. I mean, I don't know if you remember, there was something called lens lock. Yes. <laughs> but that was just one of many, many, many measures. Um, one thing we did, for instance, is we tried to change the way the game loaded. So we made the game so it had a very small header, overwrote the Sinclair loader, and then put our own loader in. And then our own loader did it with a really fancy pattern on the screen, but, but it really didn't answer. So, so then... I was thinking back to my days of doing the the commercial accounting software. And what they did to protect their accounting software was they supplied a dongle. And the dongle plugged into the back of your, you know, this is big old-fashioned computers, plugged in, basically. And the software wouldn't work without the dongle. So I said to, to David and to Mark, I said what we could do is we could make a, a dongle that plugs into the back of the Sinclair Spectrum, or the, or the Commodore 64, or whatever, and the software goes and looks for the dongle, and it'll only work if the dongle's there. Now, what I thought, what I was thinking of, was maybe a resistor or a capacitor array, which you could read, or, or, or at the very most, a little, a little custom chip that, that you could mass, you know, mass produce very cheaply for pennies. That was my idea. And then what they decided was, hell, what we can do is we can put 64K of RAM in the dong- dongle and switch it. And suddenly, the, 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 the whole idea exploded like Topsy and became the mega games, Cyclops and Bandersnatch. Well, these are the two things that a lot of people remember Imagine for, though. those two games that, yeah, like you said, it was, how expensive were they going to be? They were going to be much more than the, the average game. Oh, the games then, I can't remember, was four ninety five or something, and these were going to be 40 or 50 quid because you had to pay for the damn box on the back, you know, the, the dongle with a 64k of memory in. So they took what could have been an idea that might have worked and they just took it to the nth degree when it wouldn't work. Well, like you said, you had the job of doing the marketing here and these games, I mean, I remember 
seeing those adverts and how hyped they were in the media at the time. And it was, you know, it was really exciting advertising, but it, it kind of felt like you, know, you were promising the world with, with these games that were coming out. I mean, how did you approach marketing these two, like, mega games? Well, blimey. First of all, the guys who were supposed to, they were doing two teams of two, and they weren't doing anything. The guys weren't doing anything. The games weren't being written. So each month came by, and I'd say, what am I going to do? We've got the advertising booked in the magazines. And I said, well, <laughs> you have to go away and think about it. So I did adverts like reinforcements arrive, where they had the musicians and the artists arrived, and things like that. And I, that, because I didn't have any, any substance. I had no substance at all. I had, I had nothing. I was, I was just advertising complete vapor work. It didn't, there was nothing there to market. I was, I was marketing nothing. So there was no development or nothing running before it actually got cancelled? There was doing, there was token development, but nothing of substance. So remember these games are going to be much bigger than the average like Spectrum and C64 game. And yeah. they're going to have stuff like, you know, extra stuff in the box and... Um, Essentially, these were going to be like, you know, massive, big budget titles that I, you just couldn't imagine the average kid in like the mid 80s being able to afford. That's true. They've gone a step too far in their ambition, perhaps. And did you try and rein them back in? Were you, was anyone like saying to these guys, this is like not going to work? Or? No, well, I, I worked there, but the, the company was owned by Mark and David. And they thought the success of the company was down to their genius. And if anything they touched and everything they said would turn to gold. So it was very difficult to, to, sort of, to actually approach them with, with any reality. Well, did you know that Charlie Brooker was going to use um, Bandersnatch for inspiration for his recent Black Mirror movie? I thought that was no, 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 I didn't. Yeah. But, uh, but, it, but, it, but it, it just shows mm. how ingrained in popular culture that marketing was, because there was nothing else except the marketing. I mean, the Brooker thing, was, all it was about was what was effectively just a piece of marketing. So at what point did you kind of realise things were going wrong for Imagine? Oh, I don't know. I, I think I thought that with, with sense that Imagine had assets that could be rescued, that there was some worth there to somebody else. And, and, and I pr approached other companies with that view in mind, you know, outside the industry, for them to come into this new form of entertainment. But... Mark, it was impossible with Mark and David, really. Really, it, it, it was imp impossible with them. And, and one thing I wanted to do is I wanted to bring the price down from four ninety nine to two ninety nine. And we, we, we were going to do this, and we spoke to, to W.A. Smith and, and, and what have you, and Boots, who were the big retailers then, and they said, if you do that, we won't buy anything off you. So we were stopped from bringing the price down. Because you think at that time, that must have been like the average British kid's pocket money. Yeah, it, it would have been good if we'd been able to bring the price down, uh, because then obviously the budget game scene did come along eventually. And the budget game scene was about, you know, is it worth paying that little bit, the, the, the one ninety nine that they were, to have the real thing instead of having a, you know, a stolen fake? And, and it was. Yeah, that's when companies like Mastertronic came along and started doing it. That's right. Mastertronics yeah. were pretty clever people because the industry was broken and they had a fix for it. The industry was broken because all the customers were stealing from you instead of spending money. And, you know, you, you can't survive if everything's always being stolen from you all the time. And, and Mastertronic got around this stealing thing by making what looked like a full price product, but you know, at one ninety nine. Well, let's get back to that commercial breaks documentary. I mean, did you actually watch that after it went out then? I mean... Yeah, I saw it? that. Yeah. How much access did they have then? Was it kind of they could film anything or...? Yeah, except when somebody said they couldn't, but they, they got quite a lot of access. Well, there's that famous scene when the, the bailiffs arrived. Um, that I know you, you were actually in, in the building at the time. What do you remember of that? And was, was that like a shock or did you see it coming? No, no, nothing was a shock. No, 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 no. No, I, I left before the end anyhow, uh, because I just couldn't handle Mark and David's stupidity and attitude. So they, they were not doing anything coherent to, to solve the problem. And I think it kind of showed, you know, that they, they weren't around at the end, and you, you were still there, like kind of the last man standing, I guess, in that documentary at least. Yeah, that, 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 that they had gone to America because they thought they could go to Silicon Valley and walk into an American games company, and the American games company gave them a big pile of money. That was their master plan. But the American Games Company looked 
or what Imagine was, and couldn't see any value there, obviously. The, the sad thing, really, was that a lot of really good talent left the industry then and never came back. You know, programmers and artists and musicians went into other industries. They left the video game industry. And, uh, and, and I say never, ever came back. Well, you happened to stay in the industry and you moved on to Codemasters shortly after. Um, when yeah, did you... I had, a, I had a, pile, a, a while at Tansoft, which was the software arm of Oric first. Also, I did some stuff for Oxford Computer Publishing for Bill Richardson uh, and, and, and his Spectrum software. He, he did business software on the Spectrum. And I did some stuff for him. And I saw their first advert in CTW. And I thought, ah, these guys are interesting. Because at long last, there was somebody who was, who was going to break the, 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 the bro- you know, get, fix the broken business model, basically. I know. When did you first meet the Darling Brothers? Oh, I rang them up off their advert and I went and saw them straight away. I mean, within a day or two days. And I said that I could do things for them. Um, they employed me to start with on about, I think, three days a week, just two or three days a week. And then they, after I'd been there like two weeks, they said, we want you full time. And that, and, and, and that was it, really. Because they were very young at the time, weren't they? How old were they at that time? Well, that they could drive just about. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, I mean, the, the business was Jim. It wasn't them. Hmm. You know, G- Jim Darling was the businessman. Well, you became operations manager at Code- Codemasters. And again, I mean, like you said, uh, imagine you really promoted like the people. Because, I mean, the Darling brothers became the faces of the company, didn't they? Yeah, and, and, and all, many other people as well. Hmm. You know, uh, the Oliver Twins, Peter Williamson, Gavin Rayburn... Lots of people got the, the, the got the marketing, and and in fact, if you look at some of those people, look at the Olivers, for instance, it was the most successful time of their life. Yeah. When when they had this marketing being done for them. And how do you approach like the newspapers and the mainstream press and stuff with them? Then what what kind of angle did they were they interested uh, in? Ah, okay. So once again, I thought I need to have a mainstream PR company, but I thought to myself, I want one a proper one in London that delivers proper results because now people know what games are. It was not like uh, when I was to imagine when I was banging my head against a brick wall, pretty much. Now, it, the, the door was open as long as you had the right message. So, so it was, it was, it, things had moved on a lot. So I then rang round a, a few journalists in different industries, in the, in the music industry and in the film industry and in the fashion industry, which are all, you know, marketing-based industries, and across different sorts of media as well, you know, magazines, newspapers, radio, TV. And I rang all these journalists, spent about half a day doing it, and I asked them who was their favorite PR company, who gave them good stories, etc., etc., etc. And I came up with a short list, but the one that was top by miles was Lynn Franks. So we went and saw Lynn Franks, Jim and I, and we gave them a monthly fee. And so it was Lynn Franks that did it. Well, it always seemed like a very kind of family company, Codemasters. What was it like working there? Yes. Um, Very, very difficult. Uh, You know, very difficult. Because any success the company has is down to their genius all the time, when usually it isn't. So there's a a, a big ego problem there, dealing with, because they genuinely think it, it was because they wrote amazing games but if you go and look at those initial games that they did like bmx simulator they were not that good no they were just the norm for the market but you know with commercial aggression and marketing they established market share yeah that seemed like a bit of a running trend in in that era then from from what you're saying it's kind of like you know dealing with these kind of these, these people with big egos then i guess you had to learn to kind of people manage them as well i guess and and deal yeah, with the, them. The, the best thing that ever happened to Codemasters. The only reason, you know, Codemasters is there today and, you know, and grew to be so big, really, was that they employed a professional. They employed him as as a a financial director to start with and they made him managing director, a guy called Nick Wheelwright. And most of the success is down to Nick Wheelwright. He was the professional who made the company. Well, this time, you know, Curbmasters, not, you know, not the expensive stuff Imagine was doing. This time, you know, one thing they definitely got right was that, you know, they, they were known for the budget games. So. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's another thing that was interesting because, mm. uh, I mean, the, the budget games were 199 or 195 or whatever. And the, this is just 
a very interesting piece of marketing. So the company was always short of money because there was no margin in it. Because after you'd given your retailer their margin, and after you'd paid to have the, the things duplicated and you'd paid for the printing, and after you'd paid the staff, you, it, that it was wafer, wafer thin. So there, there was no future to it. You, 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 were, you were flogging a dead horse, basically. And so I, I said to them, I said, I can make it work that we can sell these at two ninety nine. You see, if you sell at two ninety nine instead of one ninety nine, you're making a huge amount more profit. You're making like thirty or forty times more profit mm. because your staff wages remain the same, your duplicating and printing costs remain the same, but you're getting a lot more money in from your customers per cassette. So going to two ninety nine really made the company massively profitable. So what I did is I wrote a letter to all our retailers saying that the gains were going to go up to 299 starting at the beginning of the next month with the new month's titles. But then I said, your trade price is going to stay at 199 for the first month. So, and I did a press release to all the games mag saying our games are going to be 299 retail. So suddenly all our customers saw a way to make a fortune because they could buy off us at the old 199 trade price and sell at the 299 new price. Yeah, that's pretty clever. <laughs> yeah. So, for the month, all our games just went dung. All our new releases went like one, two, three, four in the charts. We owned the charts. And at the end of the month, I got our salespeople to ring around everybody and say, look, you know, Next week, the price should go up to the new trade price, but you can buy now still just you know, the special transition price. So they put in massive orders at the end of that month. What happened was, of course, those games were on the top shelf and, and they had the impetus. And when they went up to the, the 2 99 trade price, they had to keep on buying them off us. It moved the market for new games to 2 99 But still our old games, like BMX Simulator and everything, which were still selling... They were still one ninety nine, so I repeated the trick. I sent a press release out to all the magazines and saying all our back catalogue of games they're going up to two ninety nine too. But you've got a whole month of buying at the old trade price. Look how much money you can make. <laughs> so they did. They bought like crazy, and the they were all a lot of all the games that we'd ever done before came back up the charts. And we ended up with just, a, according to the Gallup poll, and now the Gallup poll was computer stores and high street shops and didn't take account of, like, convenience stores and filling stations where we had a big presence. But, so Gallup understated our market share, but by Gallup, we were just under 40% of the total UK market. That's crazy, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. And, and nobody, nobody has done that before or since. And you just know they'll have been, you know, every shop you went in, I imagine they were promoting them in front of the store and everything, you know. That's, that's right. Yeah. And, and, and once again, that's marketing. Some people think that marketing is just about buying advertising space or whatever. It isn't. Marketing is managing the relationship between the product and the, and the end user. And, and, and that relationship, you know, there's, there's many facets to it. And one of those facets is, is the pricing policy and your relationship with the retailers. Well, when the Oliver Twins came along with Dizzy, yes. they kind of uh, seemed to be new faces of the company. Was this a uh, like conscious decision to get them in front? Yeah, well, I think one thing was that doing press work is fairly tedious. If you're trying to build a company and run a company, you've got to go running down to London and, and everything all the time. And, and, and you've got to give up your Saturdays and your Sundays to be on television and all this sort of stuff. After a while, it starts, it starts to wear you down. And also, the, the story of David and Richard had been done to death, really, by then. You know, they'd been in all the colour sub, all the Sunday colour supplements. They'd been in every single one. And they'd been on every Saturday morning TV programme and every Sunday morning TV programme. So I switched the... I, I, first of all, we, we stopped using Lynn Franks because we'd achieved what we needed. And then I went back to the trade, to, 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 to the you know, game industry media. But then they wanted to know us because then we were famous. Whereas before, you were, it was really, really hard work talking to them because you weren't buying advertising off them because there was no advertising spend in, in, in 199 games. Now that you were famous, they wanted to know. So I, I, I just... 
got you know Peter Williamson, Gavin Rayburn, the Oliver Twins, and so on, and 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 put them in front of the press, really. Did you have to kind of look, like work like a manager, like you know, say for example, like you know, musicians are kind of got like an image crafted and all that, and this is kind of what you what you guys are like. This is the image we've made for you. Was it a bit like that? Um, I, I don't think it was quite so formal as that, really. Mm. Um, but they each, I mean, like the Oliver Twins were incredibly earnest, as you probably know. Yeah. And so I just let them go and be incredibly earnest. And, and you know, the, 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 they were being incredibly earnest with the press. And, and, and I thought that'll do. And then Gavin, at Rayburn, very concerned about his image and, and his hairdo and his clothes and everything. You know, and, and he, he looked like a, a pop singer. So I thought, well, that'll do for that. Thank you very much. And then Peter is, is you know, slightly shambolic, uh, taciturn Scotsman. And I thought that'll do perfectly for that. You know, I, I didn't need to do any image work on them. They each had their images that worked already. I mean, you know, we've talked about, the, you know, kind of managing the company and the marketing and that kind of thing, but um, the actual games themselves, I mean, were, were you much of a gamer yourself? Did you play the games? Did no, you get time? No, 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 no. I've never, ever, ever, ever been a gamer. Never. I don't go to the cinema much. I'm kind of a doer rather than a watcher, mm -hmm. if you see what I mean. Yeah. Um, I'd, I'd, I'd rather be out, you know, sailing or walking or scuba diving or, you know, or traveling to different countries I'd, I'd, or down the pub with my friends. I'd rather be down the pub with my friends than play, playing games. And, and that's just my nature. It's just me. Um, you know, I've, 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 I've seen lots of games and I, I've had a go at lots of games. I mean, a lot of people who are listening to this and will think I'm mad. You know, <laughs> because because they're the exact opposite. Mm -hmm. But you know, if we were all the same, it would be a boring world, wouldn't it? Absolutely. I mean, you know, when Dizzy came along, I mean, I remember that was such a phenomenon. I mean, was was Dizzy a hit out of the door, or did it take a while to kind of build that popularity? Oh, Dizzy, Dizzy, we did, we did some funny things with Dizzy. Um, we did the, the 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 Olivers did the the toy, the model of Dizzy, the toy, mm -hmm. and then that was a whole. There was a whole saga about that that ran for several months with one of the magazines. Oh, that it had been kidnapped and <laughs> it had its head chopped off and all sorts of stuff was going on. Um, but, but then, the Olivers, I convinced them to let me cover mount a full dizzy on one of the magazines. And nobody had cover mounted a hit game before then. There was something that was already a hit game. And we cover mounted on or whatever it was, was well, Sinclair user or whatever. Uh, we cover mounted, and the, the cover, those magazines then had a circulation of, of well over 100,000. So the 120,000 copies of Dizzy just went boom out in one week. After that, the, 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 the Dizzy brand w w was made. It was, it was made just like that, really, just by the cover mount. And it was such a fun character as well. I mean, you know, it's still popular today, Dizzy. And I remember all the magazines that have all those, you know, any, any egg puns they could get in there that always been the titles and everything. So they always had fun writing about the game. Oh, yeah. And, and, and the Olivers had, 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 had enormous fun, uh, you know, creating the series. That's true. And with the magazines, I mean, because they were so important back then, I mean, did you have a really good relationship with all of the, the major mags? Yes. I, I, I mean, yeah, I, but back then... Uh, you know, I, 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 knew, I, knew, I knew all the editors, all the main journalists. And also, for me, uh, CTW was incredibly important because, to me, I wanted to market to the trade, you know, to the retailers and to distributors, and then let them do the marketing out onto the high street. And, uh, and CTW was brilliant because it reached the trade. And so many of our competitors put all their emphasis into the, into the retail advertising, you know, the, into Sinclair User and, and all those, and they didn't put the emphasis into CTW that they should have done. One amazing product that I saw from Codemasters was the Game Genie. And... Uh, okay, I'd left by then. Ah, you'd left by then. Okay, yeah, now, cool. At the beginning, in the budget days, I said to them, I said to them, I will work for you for 12 months for only a very, very low basic survival salary because they were a startup company. So I said, I will work to you, but at the end of the year, I want to go on to a proper salary. And I was working for them for £8,000 a year. And at the end of the year, I said, well, the year's up now. And they said, well, we don't want to pay you anymore. And they were rolling in from the money I'd made. You know, I'd made all this money for them, and they wouldn't even give me a, a decent salary. So I walked out. That's crazy. 
Yeah, I just walked out. And, and, and I started running my computer fair business. But pretty soon, they asked me to go back. And in the end, they said that they had a problem with Japan and could I go and solve the problem with Japan. So I semi-solved the problem with Japan for the Game Genie, in fact. But the, the, once again, the stupidity of, of, of some people. Before I went to Japan, I read up about Japan and about the etiquette and about their business practices and business customs. And you have to show enormous respect to everybody there in business. You, know, you have to bow down, you have to hand over your business card in a certain way, and so on. So one of my cousins was a director of Yamaha in the UK, and he gave me some really good introductions in, in Tokyo. So I went to Tokyo, and I, and, 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 and I met these introductions, and I was making good progress. And then to, to continue it, I had to go again. And Codemaster sent somebody else with me. And the person they sent with me was an idiot. He had no respect for the, for the Japanese. He would turn up late for meetings with, with, the, with the key people we wanted to do business with. He would turn up late. He'd say, well, in America, it's okay to turn up late. And I'd say, well, this isn't America. Mm. This is Japan. And he said, well, if they want to do business with us, they, 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 it doesn't matter that we turn up late. And I said, it does if, you, if you've offended them. But... You know, and, and, and so the, the, the Japanese venture became to naught, basically, because they sent an idiot out with me. So even I thought, you know, with, with the Game Genie itself, I mean, I imagine Nintendo probably weren't a big fan of that product initially. N no, I, but I, I, I don't think uh, the console companies were pretty, were harmed by it, really, were they? No. I don't think it did them any damage. If anything, it'd probably give games a bit of longevity, I imagine. Yeah, because you, know? yeah. Yeah, you still had to purchase a game in the first place yeah. to uh, <laughs> use it. Yeah. And, and they, they continued to, to try and ask me to come back because what they discovered is that they couldn't find anybody else who could do the same enterprising things. So they tried to get me back, really, and I wouldn't go back because by then I'd set up all formats computer fairs and I was running computer fairs all over Britain. When did you go back then, eventually? Uh, I went back uh, uh, around about a PlayStation 1 time. Yeah. So, so then, uh, <laughs> Gavin Rayburn had, a second, <laughs> had, had me a second time, because obviously I, 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 I did the stuff with BMX Simulator and, and Race Driver and uh, Football Manager and all those games. And, and that 32-bit era as well, I mean, back in the PlayStation was obviously the right horse to back in hindsight. And, and there's so many know, new systems then, though, wasn't there? Must but have been but it wasn't enough. the same thing happened. Yeah. It happened exactly the same again. What happened was that the games were copied and people were going around door to door selling PlayStation 1 black discs with the latest games pirated. Yeah. And they're going door to door all over Britain selling these pirated games. And we, we'd, when we launched a new game, it would sell for a week. It wouldn't sell anymore. I mean, some of the idiots say, one time, one of our games, it went, entered at the top of the charts week one, and week two it fell away. And so the darlings went, oh, this is terrible. You know, we're only getting a fraction of the sales that we should be getting on this game, a tiny fraction. And, 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 and my case said, so don't worry about this, I've got a TV advert ready, just give me £200,000 and then we'll reverse that and we'll get it back up again. So I spent the £200,000 and nothing happened. It just threw £200,000 away because they didn't understand what the problem was, even though I was telling them what the problem was. Yeah, I mean, I remember every kid at school, you know, you could get your PlayStation chip for like £10 or something. It, it wasn't exactly. difficult. And yeah. I told them, and they would not listen or would not believe it. And I told them that, we're, that the £200,000 would achieve nothing, and they threw it away. They might, you know, they might as well have just stood under a cold shower turning up £50 notes for all the good it did. I mean, it was, it was just a, a ridiculousness. But we had a stroke of luck. We had Operation Flashpoint. An Operation Flashpoint on the PC, uh, written uh, in the Czechoslovakia, was the best war simulation game up to that time. And we had no money to spend on advertising. We had a zero advertising budget for that game. <laughs> it 
it's all got a race driver. So there was no budget. So all we could do was PR and online stuff. And we had a really, really good online guy called Nick Pilly. And Nick Pilly and I used to get in the to work really early in the morning before anybody else, you know, seven o'clock or whatever. And we'd make our plans about how we were going to, what we were going to do to, to rev this game up and get it working. And by then I'd put in a press release mechanism, which was global and in all the languages and simultaneous and was fully supported by assets on each press release. So on, on a game I could do you know, monthly press releases, bang, 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 down the line. So that's what I did with Operation Flashpoint. I used press release mechanism that I'd built up. And when it came out, the game went to number one in every market in the world with a chart. It was a monster. It was one of the most monster games ever up to then. You know, and it went number one in America. You know, Codemasters, one and only ever number one in America. And, 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 and Flashpoint, and then, of course, you know, Flashpoint was eked out with, 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 with uh, add-on packs and so on. You remember, at that time, if you walked into a computer game shop, half of it was PC box games. Yeah. So Operation Flash, you know, it was half the market was PC box games. So that was huge. And that's all that kept Codemasters afloat. Codemasters would have gone bust without, without Operation Flashpoint. And I think it proved kind of how, how the industry changed over, you know, that, that decade and a half or so, you know, when you went from like those Ziploc bags to suddenly worldwide releases and press releases on the internet. I mean, it was a hell of a change, wasn't it? Yeah, it, it, it was good. And I, I, was, I, was, I was lucky to be involved and, and contributing at the beginning, very, very beginning of the video game industry in the world. But also, our <laughs> double fortune, I was also instrumental and lucky enough to be at the very beginning of the, of the personal computer industry in the world with my computer store. So there's two industries that, you know, I was fortunate enough that they're now multi-billion pound industries that I was lucky enough to see the genesis of. And Bruce, you've got some great stories as well. I mean, you know, that you've got blogs online that I, I will link to in our show notes as well, that, you know, you can spend a good couple of weekends reading those. You know, it's, uh, the, I think our interview today has only just uh, scratched the surface, really, hasn't it, of some of your stories? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I could write a book. But yeah, yeah. It, it, the main thing I, I found, really, was you've always got to respect and listen to the customer, the end user. And you've always got to... You're competing for their money, for their spend. For, you know, they can go and spend it on something else. So, so you have to give them uh, uh, an experience. And that experience is, isn't, you know, isn't the cassette or the disc. It's, it's the whole emotional thing of the image. Uh, uh, you know, it, it, it's a much bigger thing. And, and, and you have to create that. Well, it's been wonderful talking to you. And, uh, you know, after talking to you today, it would be great if you ever did get around to writing a book. I'm sure lots of people would be interested in reading that. I, I, I've read the book. I've read the Oliver's book. Yeah. The ego in there is beyond belief. <laughs> it, it, that everything that happened was due to their genius, you know. And I, 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 it's unbelievable when you read that book. It, it, it bears no relationship to what actually happened. The, the lack of modesty was just incredible. <laughs> And I'm glad that you can set the record straight, Bruce, and tell us, uh, you know, what, what really happened in these uh, th these incredible companies that we, we grew up reading so much about. Um, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you well, so thank much for being here. Thank you ever so much. I, I appreciate it. I've enjoyed it.